So uh, we get to talk with Dan Wood and Lois is there helping as well. And we are at DWRI Letterpress. Their focus is on fine letterpress printing, whether that's from wood, metal, or even plastic type. Uh, we don't judge, even though we're a wood type museum. We know that all letterpress helps further this history. Uh, they're a full service letterpress print shop, which means they also do design work, in-house uh, polymer plate making, custom die cutting, hot foil stamping, and book binding. I'll admit, when I found out that they foil stamp pencils, I have a feeling I know a new thing that you will see in the Hamilton store soon. I haven't run this by Tootsie, but I am now enamored with some new pencils for Hamilton. Hey. I know, right? <laughs> we'll have to come up with some interesting sayings for our pencils. Um, the Linotype Daily Project, which at times made us see things from a different perspective, made us just nod our heads in agreement, or even sometimes weep with frustration was and is, um, it was a daily posting of new line and type projects from March 1st, 2019 to February 29th of 2020. And now it is occasionally. And uh, Jim said it earlier today when we were chatting, he called it definitely hot off the presses. And I liked that. I think that's a really nice way to wrap up uh, what the line and type daily project is, but we'll hear more about it from Dan. And my last little snippet is to say, we're really excited to talk to Dan. Um, to talk to a shop with a working Ludlow and linotype line casting machines uh, is, is thrilling when we, we can't plug ours in. Uh, Dan is the founder and driving force at DWRI Letterpress. He received a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Rhode Island School of Design in 1994, and he's an adjunct prof professor at Rhode Island School of Design. So Dan, I wanna say thank you so much. Lois, we're glad you're there to help us as well. Um, and I'll hand it over and, and I'll be behind the scenes to help you out. So thank you so much, Dan. Yay, thank you so much. And thank you for everyone for coming and for the warm welcome. I'm gonna try really hard to look at the camera and not the screen over there, but it's so tempting. That's what screens do to people. Uh, my name is Dan Wood. This is Model 31 Linotype at TWRI Letterpress, which came originally from Little Roadie Press up a few miles from here. The only housekeeping business that we have here is our bathroom is out the door to the left, all the way down. And then you can probably take a left and then you will see it. I don't know, that's a long way from Wisconsin, but uh, just in case, like we're all, we always do that in the tours, right? Because we're the bathroom. It's not so important virtually. Anyways, um, yes. So my name is Dan Wood. We are a, commercial letterpress print shop. I studied uh, fine art printmaking. Well, originally I studied history, took some time off, went back to school, studied fine art printmaking, and then for about 10 years worked as a uh, offset, commercial offset press operator while I was learning from other printers about letterpress printing on the side. So all of us here, there's myself, Lois Harada, Tom Sprankle, and Hope Anderson are all, you know, coming to this work with an artistic perspective, but uh, with a lot of commercial background. And so I really, really am excited to be working with the Hamilton Museum. Uh, but I'm really excited to be coming to this from, you know, a commercial printing perspective. You know, we really, really like, uh, printing things well. And so you talk to a lot of whether they're commercial letterpress printers or commercial offset printers, you know, we will work from our own designs, we'll work sending type, we'll do other things. But if you're working with a graphic designer, working directly with a the customer, there is something really nice about just, you know, working with this process, which is A, so much fun, B, like can be in insanely infuriating, but it's just, you know, working with the process is such a, a sort of joy and a privilege that that's the thing that really keeps us sort of going through um, the nonprofit. So there's something worse than nonprofit in terms of running a business aspect of letterpress printing and being artists and all that kind of stuff. Okay, anyway, so that is the background. What we're gonna do really quickly is just show you a little bit about, uh, about the shop. Then I know that there are many people here who may or may not have actually seen a linotype uh, machine in use. So we'll talk a little bit about the linotype. 
Maybe we'll talk about the Lazo, and then I'll describe how I use these machines to make these linotype daily posts. And, and it's sort of the end of a long search for the best way to use these machines um, as an artist. Okay, so what we might do, we're gonna see if this works or not, but we're gonna try switching to a mobile device for the cameras. First of all, uh, hi everybody. Our hot metal area here with a new executive corner over there, which we're super excited about, or at least somebody is, because I get my own refrigerator. I don't have to leave my leftovers to everybody else, which would be bad. Uh, we have our Linotype magazines. Each magazine here is a one typeface at one size in two styles, basically. So we have this magazine rack. There's a bank over there. There's maybe another 20 or 30 magazines. There's more over here. There's more on the other side. Uh, we'll describe what these guys are all holding later. I'm not getting signaled by the camera operator. Okay. <laughs> we do foil stamping on our Heidelberg windmill. Over here, there's more metalwork on uh, our Ludlow. We just picked up some new mats from Dave C which I think actually were coming from our SOS line of type when they were closing down. All right, I'll just pause here for a brief second. So for those who are not familiar with line casting, type casting machines, what a line of type does and what a, line, what a line of does is instead of casting and then setting by hand individual sorts of type, it's actually combining all of the type that you have cast, all the matrices, casting it, and then you have this line or a slug, right, of type. So unlike the line of type, just like hand set type setting, you're actually setting everything in a stick. You've got your Ludlow cases. If you're ever carrying a little chops, you see cases. Those are Ludlow cases. This is a self-centering stick. We're just going to tighten this up, turn on the machine. Back there, make sure everybody is happy. You may or may not see there's a crucible of molten lead right there. Somebody's happy birthday. And then kablamo, you have your slide. So literally, this might be then turned on a proof press, made any corrections recast, and then put on to the commercial work. But literally, there are line of type machines that were made to. So, uh, the line of type daily project, I'd be coming to the Lundo, set my headline, measure the width for the body tax, and then come over here and just keep going like that. So, it really would be. Okay, coming this way, we have polymer plate making over here. We have some Hamilton type uh, here from a fine art print, but really, what's the difference? Which I think is unit, you guys would know more. It's unit Gothic 22 or 32. And we did have some CNC laser cut because we were missing some of the letters. So you can see in certain points, it's not as sharp as it should be, like in that A compared to here, because we never went in with little files. So I may have some questions for you guys as to how to make that work. Uh, okay, then moving along, we have the handset type, which is at this point more wood type than anything else, because once you start casting type, you really uh, don't want to use the handset metal type anymore. Our two small Proof presses. We have our office over here, which is a gallery space slash Lois's office with some reclaimed wood that was being thrown away. Then this is called Anderson hiding behind the hand foil stamper. And Thomas will disappear. A paper cutter, our job table over here. So this is where. You know, you're going to come see what this is all about. These are going to be mainly letterpress QR codes. This would be on the commercial side of things. 
We have some packaging for a fancy sock maker. Blah, 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 blah. Then the first press, I have for her, up here is a Shimmer and Price new series, I think from the 19, probably about 1913, I think. It came out of a shop in Newport, Rhode Island. And I was working in an offset printer and some faxes came in about old equipment somebody was getting rid of. And for any of you people out there that are thinking about like getting into letterpress printing, picking up some equipment is a very dangerous thing because you take like, literally you take like one step over that threshold to picking up a supposedly free 1600 pound press. And then like you blink your eyes and suddenly you're like literally surrounded by stuff that like you can't even count as high as it, as it weighs. So I do remember like saying yes to this guy in the garage and just being like, oh my God, this is where all my dad junk collector friends got started. But I've never bought some of those. Fluky for foil stamping, I mean, die cutting, embossing, depossing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then this press, the poly press, which is like a, a Heidelberg cylinder, uh, which means that it is not running up like a platen press, like most of the other automatic side presses that we have but it's got a pimpin on the main cylinder, just like on a Vandercook. And the difference is that unlike in a Vandercook, the cylinder is actually standing stationary. The paper would be automatically feeding if you're actually printing something. And then the type ah, is, in this case, the column of base, the type is rotating underneath. All right. The cylinder on this bed of oil, but it means you can do really fine register with really, really heavy uh, ink coverage uh, on this type of press. One of the pieces is just another set of wallpaper for an artist named Andrew Raftery. And so there's some finished pieces over there. So we are a really weird shop because, you know, on one hand, we're doing you know, this would be a good job for us as a commercial run for local university. And, you know, you can run large numbers, you know, very affordably because you're running all this automatic equipment. So we may be doing something like this. We might be foil stamping 10 or 15 sheets of something that Hope is doing. And then we might be working with an artist on these wallpapers. So it's fun for us, but it really is a strange place to just have such a weird uh, combination of work. That makes sense. Now, uh, I don't know if there's any questions, but we can get to them at the end after we talk about things. But if you do have any questions, put them in the chat and like you're saying, what the heck is that weird thing um, over there? I'm not gonna turn on the Heidelberg windmill and I'm gonna restrain myself. Okay, so now the project, we go back to the thing, does that make sense? Okay. Okay, we are switching over to your laptop. Is that correct? You guys want to hear my voice? This is going so <laughs> well. Uh, okay. You're a little fuzzy. Anyways, this right here is Wait, a line But you're out of focus. Yeah, yeah, it's doing its weird thing. <laughs> I'm gonna unplug and plug it in. And right, this one more time. Yeah, that looks a Look better. at that. That, that, looks, that looks great. Thank you. Perfect. So, uh, a line type machine basically was invented in the 1880s, 1885, and it is the machine that replaced handset typesetting. So, throughout the 19th century, there was, towards the second part of the 19th century, a big rush because printing it pretty much got as fast and efficient as it could. They had big steam powered presses, newspaper presses, but all of the type, anything that needed to be set uh, was being set by hand. So a city might have, a big city might have, you know, two or three or four major newspapers, but those newspapers are gonna be limited to, you know, the amount of type that could be set, turned into stereotypes, printed, redistributed, and then, reset the next day. So things were 
that was sort of the the blocking point in terms of what could make printing a little bit faster. So Linotype machine was invented by a German uh, watchmaker, Otmar Bergenthaler, and it was the machine that could successfully do this. It really is so insanely complex, but it actually worked. There are other, there's a page type setter, there are other machines that, uh, that just could not quite work. And what that meant was that with faster printing, right, if typesetting was the, the slow part of the operation, once you could actually set type automatically via a keyboard, which is still a pretty new concept for uh, communicating information with people, right? Suddenly you could set, you know, maybe eight or 10 lines faster than you could uh, hand typesetting, right? So that what that meant was it was sort of like another printing revolution after Gutenberg. So the line type comes around and literally books became so much cheaper to produce because things that had lots of volume. Newspapers meant that the newspapers A could be bigger, right? They're gonna be better printed because the type is gonna be so much more consistent, but also the availability of information in different viewpoints would spread that much faster because you could have a 20 page paper, you could have a socialist paper, you could have a conservative paper, you could have the business newspaper, you could have so many different places and it's not, it's still a huge investment, but much more uh, within the realms of possibility, basically. So, and then school textbooks was another thing that the line of type just had such an influence for that you really were, you know, opening up the realm, you know, in a democracy, which is so important of information, of literacy, of different viewpoints to such a broader spectrum of the population that uh, you know, people who work with linotypes always give it the spiel, but you're still kind of excited about it. Um, so this machine here is from the 1950s. It's a model 31. It's really pretty much, there's different details here or there, but really any a, a machine like this really is not so different than like a model 14 or any linotype they would have been making maybe after 1914 or 1910. Like it really is uh, pretty much with some improvements, the same basic design. Newspapers kept using linotype machines really up until I think the, the New York Times was 1978. We have another linotype over in the corner, which came from Actually, I think that came from the New York Times. It was used in the for the editorial for the some part of the editorial page that was that particular. Uh, it was in that particular section of the composing room. It came from a guy Dick Goodwin who picked it up somewhere in Connecticut. But what is the point? Linotype, other linotype. We're going to get there. Linotype, other linotype. Oh, the point is that the big newspapers held out until the late 1970s had such an investment in the equipment. And then it was such a drastic change for the workers and the unions that they were able to keep it going for a certain amount of time until eventually people were switching from having used all of this hot metal equipment to phototype setting into different uh, steps like that. However, that machine, that's why I was thinking about it, came, it came from the New York Times, but the person who I had acquired it from had worked in newspapers, I think, through the mid uh, 1980s. So a lot of smaller, this was the Quincy, I think it was the, might've been the Quincy Herald Tribune that might've gone as late as like 1985, 1988. So even into the eighties, I don't know about the nineties, there were, st it still was not unheard of that a machine could still be used for daily newspaper production. Um, the way it works, which is there's so many things about this that really is crazy, but basically the way it works is, I'll turn it on in a sec is all of these magazines that we were pointing at uh, are filled with matrices, right? And each matrix, right, is going to be, a matrix is going to basically be the reverse casting. I don't know if that's focusing or not. Something like that. Well, either way. <laughs> so a matrix basically is a, a, a 
little brass pipe, but it's the reverse casting of a letter. So you can't really see in here, but there's the mold of a letter. So just like if you're casting handset type, very different than wood type, you would actually have a metal uh, punch made, right, from a pantograph, and then that gets punched into the brass, and then gets punched onto this matrix, right, and then this is going to get incorporated to the machine, and then when you're lining up your sentence, which I'll show you in a second, right, you'd be lining up all the letters that you want on that particular line. Now, one of the things that is so insane about the lifetime machine is, first of all, it has 3,000 moving parts, right? It is like the one thing I learned doing the of daily and using these machines every single day, otherwise it would have been once a week, maybe a couple times a week, maybe once a month, is they just run so much better if you're using it frequently, but they still do demand a ton of uh, maintenance. The way it works is you, step, you tap on a keyboard over here, and the keyboard has a weird layout. So it's all the lowercase on the left, the numbers and figures in the middle and then the uppercase on the right and every time you step on a key, you tap on a key it drops a matrix right in a row so you're actually composing your lane just your line just by tapping on the key so it drops a matrix and then all right whatever sentence you're going to send you're going to cast it does its whole thing blah 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 blah, blah. once you finish typing you go to cast, and it sends all of those maps over to the uh, to composition, basically, to be cast, right? At that point, you can start casting your next line. So it can be casting type, composing type. Once it's done casting, the second elevator comes down. It brings all of the maps back up to the top of the machine. And then there's these little teeth right there, right? And... Yes. Like YouTube video tutorial. Got it. Okay. So, look, it's a, it's, the, it's the hand, the thing. Is it the same? Forget it. Anyways, uh, the Munster family. So basically, this is a uh, ninety possibilities uh, key combination. And so what happens is after you've cast, all the keys go up <laughs> to the top of the machine, and then depending on the combination, what the key code is, it rides a rail in the back of the machine, and then it drops it back into the individual slot. So you're going to be typing, casting, and redistributing all simultaneously. So not only is it incredibly fast in terms of composing your work, it's the same E that you're using in one line, it's already redistributed, and you'll be using it again two or three lines later. So it really is like a completely insane machine. On top of that, especially for newspaper and book work, uh, there's all sorts of different um, justifications. So you could be center, left, right, regular. And regular means fully justified. And what happens in that case is it drops a space band. And so this is one of the things that, like, it is like Gutenberg in the sense that with the Gutenberg Bible, when Gutenberg was making his type and printing these books, it wasn't like a phony imitation of these scribes, right? It really was trying to be competitive on an artistic and a craftsperson basis to be able to be successful at that point in the marketplace. And so the same thing with the linotype where, you know, this is a ligature for a TE, which you can't see. Can they see? Yeah, it's still hopeless. Anyway, so Linotype and Ludlow both prided themselves on, on having a very fine typographic sensibility. It doesn't mean all the people using the machines subscribe to that as well. I know I definitely did not in many of the things that I printed, but, but, but they had to at least be, if not better, at least competitive with the handset type world or no one would want to use it. Right? One of the things the machine has is these things called space bands, right? So as you are composing, you're going to set your column width, right? Just like you would by using a hand composing stick and deciding um, however long that rectangle is that you're setting type. And so I don't know if you guys can see this or not right there. It's thicker at the bottom than it is at the top, right? So the way it would work with a line type is when you're setting type, 
Okay, everything is setting, setting, setting. You've, you've told the machine what your line length is, and then what happens is it pushes up from the bottom and it makes an equal space between every word throughout the line. So it's automatically like the computer would do for us today, putting in the exact same amount of space between every word to balance out your line length. And so there's all these sort of mechanical tricks that it has that are so simple and so ingenious and yet make such a big difference in terms of uh, its final product. Um, okay, so what we'll do really quickly is I'm just gonna cast a generic line here or there. You guys can see the machine. As soon as the machine comes on, you may or may not be able to hear anything. Um, so I'll try not to give too much important information. Like the password is, Okay, that goes into very well. Um, okay, so here's the machine. So what's going to happen is whatever I type down here is sending a message through these keyboard rods that go up to the machine to this magazine. So right there are all of the actual maps ready to go. So here, like, for example, I just did a capital A and got that machine. Okay. Right now, each magazine that we said is one typeface at one size and in two different styles. So this is, I believe, a trade classic somewhat similar to a copper plate. And you've got a one position is going to be the bold, the other is going to be the light. Uh, kind of hard to see. This machine can hold four different magazines. So right now we've got the trade classic. Usually we'll have two Caledonias and then something at the bottom. If you want to change your typeface, it's not like and the computer where you just go up to font and change your typeface. You take this thing out, walk over there, grab another 50 pound piece of brass and steel and put it up at the top. So anyway, if we go over here, we're just gonna go there might be two typos in there. I'm just gonna pop them out. Okay. And we've not used this many things. So there we go. Thank you. Aquatic. Thank you, Hamilton. So now what's happened there is uh, that is the sentence that I'm excited to be casting. If this were if this were justified type, I would have changed the um Line length right here, it would stop. We would be using these space things, right? Whoops. Right here, you can sort of see how they would work. Either way, what we're going to do is go to cast this, and maybe we'll stop along the way at different points and see what happens. At this point, I'm just going to go to this. I'm going to go to cast. And so again, the plunger is about to go down. I'm just going to go. So that's the top of the machine. And then at that point, one, two, three, that pachinko sound is the sound of the mats being redistributed into the magazine. So now I'll just show you quickly. Again, I'm going to do it this way. Okay. Just to give you a little bit more sense of how this all works, there's our line that we're planning to cast. Okay. I'm going to put it in neutral. Okay. Then we let it go. The next over here, let's say go back, is you can see, yeah, I don't know if you are able to see that or not. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can see that. So that's the actual moles, the matrices all lined up to cast your line of type. And so 
One advantage, although it's not really that big of a advantage, if you're setting type or not, is all the work that you're doing is reading correctly because you're setting the mold. You're setting what the print, the type is going to print like. Uh, and then we can send it back. You can see the distribution right here. Here's our slide. Yeah. So literally, this is pretty warm, right? At the moment, you kind of get used to handling it gingerly, right? I this particular slide. Literally, I could walk over there, walk to the composing stone, drop it into a chase, and be printing. You know, moment like in minutes, two seconds, if I really wanted to. And so, you know, while I was working on this project, or if you're, you know, working in a newspaper with any kind of a deadline, you know, you're one person in the newspaper, it really is this, well, in a newspaper is very different than doing anything on your own, like with uh, contemporary letterpress printing, it is not like a small, sort of like a small town newspaper, but more in the sense that you are lucky and unlucky, but you're lucky because you really are involved in all parts of the process, you know? So for you guys, you're involved in drawing the type, cutting the type, preparing the wood, you know, that part is now done. Then setting the type, printing the type, you know, all of those things, putting your books together, that's something that for hundreds and hundreds of years in the trade was not the case, you know, except for very particular individuals. So like even to this day with students, so they're asking about bookbinding. Your know, bookbinding is such a distinct trade than printing, you know, to this day. So that there are people who are fine printers and fine bookmakers, but I have enough knowledge to talk to a bookmaker or book not a bookmaker so much, a uh, bookbinder to convey what I need to convey, but I don't know how they put books together, you know, so it really is kind of um, an interesting thing. So either way, we would have our slug at that point. I'm gonna bring you over to the, uh, where I have the length of dailies. I can show you a little bit about um, that particular project and you guys can ask whatever questions that you have. Yep. So basically what I was gonna show you very quickly is that slug that we had just passed, right? Over here, a lot of people with Van der Kirk's are working right into the press bed, but this is a chase, right? So any particular press is going to have a, the chase is the metal square, basically a rectangle. Every press is going to have a chase made for that press, right? So this is a chase for a Heidelberg window. So literally what would happen is we would, I'm not going to actually do it, but uh, uh, loosen up the chase, pop out a slug, pop in the new slug, and then, I know that's funny, and then there you go. So like if I'm working on one of these things and, you know, there happens to be a type, well, actually here, I'll give you an example here. This is the type here. That's the print that uh, came out of it, right? Yeah. And when I first had cast it, I can't remember if I fixed it on the edition or I think it fixed it that night. There's one little typo, uh, Georgia. Congresswoman has blamed Jewish space lasers for the 2018 California wildfires and a conspiracy to clear land for a high speed rail project and update to centuries old anti Semitic tropes. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene also tweeted that Nancy Pelosi should shot. Uh oh. Typo. So just, I'd done all this and then just before uh, I'm going to actually run it, photograph it, stick it on the internet. I was able to recast that line, but it was so tight that I had to pull off the space bands and put in tiny thin spaces and put the word B in there. And so then you can see here, there's some other corrections where I was too lazy to fix uh, that whole slug because the machine was being fussy. So I was cutting a B, a newly cast B and plopping it into, into position. Then you would take this and this is all starting at maybe six o'clock at night and then ending it hopefully before. This is the Heidelberg windmill. Inside, there's another chase 
right here. And so literally, we've just cast everything. We've done a quick proof. We've corrected our proof. We're coming over here. It's a flattened press, right? So it's, it's going to be a cylinder. I mean, it's going to be a platen. So the machine's going to be like a clamshell, basically. Uh, the case is here. The ink is up there. You know, suddenly that's okay. Uh, you've got your print that you can be uh, walking over the linotype as the machine is running, take your pictures, be uploading it, and trying very, 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 very hard to get home before my teenage daughter kills me and we eat dinner at 10 o'clock, which was happening a lot uh, during that year. But this is so that you can see the whole spectrum of the project. Okay, so now we're gonna move this away and run, run, run. <laughs> Too fast? Okay, go over here, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so I, I have some of the actual prints here behind me on the wall. And what I can do, I'm just gonna open up uh, this guy here. Yep, okay. And so what I'll do in a second is uh, share my screen. I can just sort of show you uh, some of the pieces that came out of this project, why I did the project. Uh, et cetera. So let me put that there. I got into this really because, here we go. Share. I'm not, so I don't know if you guys are seeing this or not. Yep, but that's good. Part of the motivation is you're using all of these old machines, right? And so as an artist, I'm always trying to uh, find a way with the linotype to use it in your, I mean, for, for many printers, it's, there's not so much of a distinction, but distinction between your artistic practice and your work practice or whatever it might be, but, but incorporating uh, hot metal typecasting into your, either your art making or your business making can be kind of a tricky thing. There's so many things that it's good at, there's so many different things you could do. So this was a project that really made a lot of sense. Uh, for me, my attraction to it, I'll just show you here. So this is that same process. So that's the Ludlow slugs, right? And then that would have been, here's the type set up. My interest in it really was as, you know, member of this society, we're just so completely bombarded with information, with Twitter, social media, newspapers, uh, everything. Bye, Lois. Um, that it becomes hard to, let me just see if there's a headline that has to do with this. It even becomes, let's see. Yeah, it even, it becomes hard to even process the information and that you don't even know what to believe, which is kind of the moment that we're in right now. So for me, with the project, it was kind of like, okay, the linotype machine really is the machine that sort of pushed printing to have a much deeper involvement in people's daily lives even than it did before. And it was the machine that sort of started us in on this information age, even though it was still existing, you know, radio and TV obviously were even more significant, but the linotype, so as the printing world is really the thing that started us with this daily newspaper, the newspapers telling you what's important, what they think is important, all these type of things. And so and it was so fast. And so for me, in the year 2000, I guess it was 19, right? The idea that you could go back to this machine that once was so fast, it was kind of like the harbinger of all these things to come, right? To go back to that once insanely fast, but now incredibly frustratingly slow process, that maybe that would be a way of kind of forcing ourselves or forcing myself to sort of sort through the information at a speed which was a little bit more human-like, even if it was still super fast. 
in the old days. And so that was kind of my motivation and kind of the thing I wanted to experiment with with this project was like, okay, you know, if this is the machine that started us in on this, maybe it's a machine or at least a process that is very hands-on, it's one person that you can actually kind of um, make some, some sense out of it. So here I'll just show you, these are just some of a few things and I promised Stephanie I would do this, but I have not yet put any of these links into the chat room, but I will do so. Uh, oh, I can help with that. You keep going, this is great. Uh, okay. And so, uh, you know, this would be the same thing. You have your, so here you can see, I would have cast the headline, which in this case is, you know, maybe erosion of the public trust is the point. And so that headline is cast in temple heavy italic. And so you do get very fond of the typefaces you have access to. And, you know, for me, that typeface in particular has so much movement and activity going on, it's kind of bizarre. Because at first you're like, oh, it's another boring sans serif. And you get into it and you're like, this type is insane. But either way, I would set the headline. I don't know if that's 18 picas, something like that. And then at that point, you're going over to the linotype and you're setting your line length there. And so you can see here, all of that is just mechanically justified. So if one was hand set typesetting this, you would have to be putting in the actual tiny little spaces to even out that line, uh, you know, one by one, whereas the line type with the use of the space bands is doing that for you. So I'll just sort of take you guys to a quick little, this to me was one of my favorite uh, headlines. And this is a uh, Metro Medium 18 point, which is the largest that we could count. And we, you started to get into these weird, I think this is the first one in this format, these formats that then the chase is already set like that. So you've got, you know, once again, at six o'clock, maybe you wrote something at lunch and you're like, you know, you just, you don't want to have to think, you know, too much further before putting something together. Uh, so that is that, this was our earlier one. This is another one where, you, you know, some of the things I'm pulling off of news, I'm, I'm, I'm relying on actual real journalists to do this work, right? And maybe putting my two cents in, maybe not. But looking back on it, you see these headlines and, you know, it's kind of like a headline you probably wouldn't see in an actual news, newspaper, right? But, it, you know, maybe it's a headline that you would be having in conversation with another person, right? But then you see it in headline, you're like, yeah, that sure does, that sure does make sense, you know? <laughs> so this was how a lot of these things uh, came together. And then, and for me, in some ways, I'd be interested in the typography. So this was after yet another UN report. So that was uh, one day. And then the next day, I, after spending all that type, I was like, you know, this is too big an issue. Like, I can't read, you know, on the, on the computer, you can read these things. But to me, I'm like, this doesn't seem important enough. And maybe I was lazy, I don't remember. So the next headline is yesterday's type kind of small <laughs> because I don't know, <laughs> that was the breaking news of that, that day. And so you start to get into these conversations with your health when you are uh, doing these things, which is kind of funny to look back at and, um, and think through. The other thing that's kind of interesting for me is, you know, I'm listening to the radio, I'm talking to a lot of people. I started a Twitter account back then just to follow things and it's just so much information. And so sometimes there's news stories that people are telling you about that you're starting to follow, but it isn't necessarily getting the coverage in another place. And so this was just something I happened to be reading, you listening to NPR and passing the type. And then I had some former students who are in uh, Puerto Rico and you know they're like, oh my God, we're so glad that this is getting this, uh, you're giving it this attention. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm Joe Blow, weird artist in the back of my shop. You know, it's sort of a, it's interesting to see how people could uh, could sort of digest the information, and and they are having their own reactions to the kinds of things that you're casting. I will say it was also it, it, a lot of things happened between 2019 and 2020, and are still happening, and so some of it would definitely get fairly, you know, just the incessant barrage of heavy news that the thing that was kind of interesting is just one person picking one little thing up 
I felt like for me, at least I just felt like I had to do something. I had to say something, bring some, uh, some relevance or some importance to these things that were going on. But it was sort of interesting because then one day you'd be doing something like that. This was another one that was going around Twitter and different places was an actual quote from someone who was trying to get a right to, to march. You know, I think it was Modesto, California. <laughs> but but for, for me, it was kind of, it was just interesting to sort of be doing these things. This was a recreation and six tiny little six point type of Donald Trump's letter to uh, the president of Turkey, but to, and then this was a much larger thing that was all Ludlow type, 96 point Armenian Gothic condensed that again, you'd be doing the small things, you'd be doing the big things. So it just, it sort of took on its own life in terms of the different formats things. So at one point you're talking about some horrible mass killing and the next day, well, it is, you know, you've got to report something and it's kind of cold out here in Rhode Island uh, on that day. And then sometimes we would have leftover dyes set up from a die cutting job that also happened to look like a uh, latka and it also happened to be Hanukkah. So everyone needs a good latka recipe, right? So that was something that was kind of uh, fun to do. And then there would also be updates, you know, from my own, um, my own personal life. If I look back at these, I definitely see you know, peanut butter is still an issue. Lately, it's been trying to survive the winter on peanut butter and red wine, which it's not so bad at first. It's just there they are. You're walking to the kitchen. There's the peanut butter and the wine is still there. And so then and then suddenly uh, you realize that your diet needs you need to expand things a little bit. Um, the other thing that was fun as we kind of moved through things is working with. Let's see here. What else is open? The little sub headlines. So it was sort of like, I don't know if there was a car cartoonist, I think it's from Toledo, Tom Oliphant, and they have these tiny little creatures on the side that uh, would always have some commentary on whatever the bigger cartoon was. And so I feel like, you know, for me, a lot of the pieces, you know, you know, you started to get this little sub story going on with whatever the bigger. Um, story might have been. This was another crazy story. Um, so either way, did it every day from February. It ended on February 29th, which was a leap day. And then I knew that it would be very difficult to just like stop because I'd gotten so involved in, you know, every night I'm going to bed, I'm staying up too late, but I'm looking through some of the news stories to see what could possibly be of interest to be casting the next day. Sometimes it's literally just, you know, you're stopping your work day at six o'clock, five o'clock, seven o'clock, and you're just like, oh my God, you know, what am I gonna do? But the world kept getting weirder. And so once it stopped, they said, okay, you know what, I'm gonna do it. It'll be the linotype occasionally. And then if I feel like doing something, it's a very different way to do things because I feel like if I'm the ones I'm doing now, I almost feel like they're a little bit more precious because you have to decide, yes, this is important. This is worthwhile to do a print about. And then you feel like, uh, I know people are really nice in the Midwest and you're not supposed to wear, but then you feel kind of like an asshole because you're like, oh, this is really gonna get them because it's such a nice thing. So, but you just have to make work however you're gonna make it and not worry about things. So this was one of the ones that was first out of the, on the occasional series. And so this was, you know, at that point in time where things were moving so quickly that, you know, by nine in the morning, you're thinking one way, and then by noon, you're realizing, you know, all the things you thought were impossible that didn't make any sense. How could you close everything down? How could this, by noon, you're like, oh my God, why didn't we do this sooner? You know, it's such a strange time period. Uh, time period that we're living in. And I would just like to report to everyone, I don't know if it was that time, but I did find, you know, the horrible source of the moths and they're pretty much under control now. So that's important. The only other thing I'd just say really quick is in the time 
since I've been doing the occasional uses, I do feel like the headlines started to become, I've done some large headlines, but much more bold because the news just seemed to encapsulate itself into one tiny word, you know, that this was, that, you know, if, I, if I'm leaving my house, touching a doorknob no one else is touching, coming to the shop where no one else is, I could justify making that excursion, it's just a couple blocks. But suddenly the things, you know, everything we were doing, it just seemed so, and this may be the case for any moment, but in our moment in particular, the things just seemed so, um, so urgent. Oops, we had to get, no, we didn't. That I realized, you know, looking back in the last, since, since last March, at least, you know, the headlines were just so much more, you know, one, two or three or four words that, you know, it's, it's all I could do, it's all that you could think about for things to, um, things to start up, to try to bring some sense into what, um, what, what we were seeing at that point. So I can hold these things up literally all day long until I got a cramp. But, um, but that pretty much, let's see, is what I've been doing for the last little while. And I would be happy to, oh yeah, this is just the sequence is important because where did it go? Nope, up oh, here it is. Uh, there also is going to be a box set. It'll be a pink box. The top is just like the bottom. There's some foil stamping. So we're in the process of trying to uh, get these boxes made and actually take the time to put it together. But it's kind of a tricky thing because it's so nice to have the paper ones to look through. But most of the time, people are experiencing this through the computer, either on their phone or their screen. And so to me, it's another weird aspect of you know, what people do. Like if you're printing something with wood type, when you put it on the computer, people are paying more attention to that because it's this beautiful handmade process. But especially in the COVID times, but even in general, more people are going to see the computer image than they're going to see the printed image. And so I really feel like um, it's been interesting to kind of negotiate that. Like I do have a subscription service where people can sign up and we'll either get it as soon as it's done or once a month type of a bundle, but it's still kind of a weird it's just a funny world that uh, here we are, which like, actually is probably my, um, there was a great poet named Bob Brown who wrote these poems in the 1920s and 30s and I think was eventually blacklisted because he was a socialist and he, his wife and his mom wrote cookbooks. And so they wrote these, the Brown family cookbooks that became very, sort of uh, middle America cookbooks, even though he was not allowed to write his poems, but he had a poem in it with just uh, autobiography, life's a funny place to be. So I think that's sort of my printing and artistic practice summed up. I'll end here in terms of the way things would repeat themselves when you start to see patterns developing is this was from December of 2019 and then just another year and a month or two later, you luckily you still have the thing, you know, the format all set, so you know it's gonna work and here we are. Uh, anyways, but I'd love to hear questions and say hello to people and uh, you can take it away. I think that sounds good. Dan, first we should give you a wonderful round of applause. Your energy and your knowledge is outstanding, thank you. The energy makes up for the lack of knowledge. I, trust me, it's been a years-long observation. Just you hit it well. A lot. It'll be fun. That, that was absolutely amazing. Um, I uh, I'm going to do a quick little spiel just yep. to say to everyone our official business, and then we'll do questions after the hour if that works for everybody. Um, so I want to say thank you all for joining. Please stick around. I'm going to do my official sphere because I know some people have meetings to do. But if you don't have meetings, stick around because now we get to ask questions. So uh, what I want to say is. Um, 
Thank you everyone who helps make this possible. So we can keep making these free events every week uh, because of members. And I know a lot of you guys are members. Thank you so much. You uh, help keep heat in the building. You help us open our doors, which we are opening our doors March 13th. Um, and you help us do programming like this. So if you are not a member, I ask, please consider it because that is how we keep the museum going. Uh, I also uh, may have been reminded that you can donate. So if you're already a member, but you think, hey, I really like to help keep this going. Um, I've put the link over there. So thank you so much. Uh, also, we do have upcoming ham hangs. Uh, next week, we are gonna be uh, with Allison Chapman of Igloo Letterpress. So we're going to another commercial shop. So different perspective, different person, different way to do things, which is exciting. Um, and then finally, you can watch the previous Hamilton hangs on the right. I will also put your links again, Dan. Um, I promise and... to send them to you. No, you're good. I'll put just the quick, easy ones. And then... Um, I wanna say thank you. And I do have a couple of questions. So I'll start with those. If anybody else has questions, put them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, the first one that somebody asked about was the manufacturer of the press where the cylinder uh, stayed stationary, but the press bed moved. Yep. But what was that one again? That was interesting. So that's a, it's called a Poly 50. It's a Poly 50 auto, auto, uh, auto mat, but it's a man press. So like what became Man Roland, it's machine, I think it's Machine Fabrik Augsburg Nuremberg. So it was a German press manufacturing company. And it really is extremely similar to, you know, we call it a Poly 50, but it's very similar to a Heidelberg cylinder, like any Heidelberg cylinder, die cutter, press, press, press. Um, I know that when I, it, that also came out of Little Roadie Press, there was a shop I'd worked in, like for many people start in on these type collecting or press using journeys, there is that moment where you like just, it's like you fall off of a cliff and suddenly you've got one, one CMP, but then there's two CMPs. You're like, okay, and then someone's got this. And you're like, mm, you know, and you want to print something that's literally one inch bigger, but the press then has to be four times as large. And so that also had been an offset shop where I worked as a press operator and I'd stopped working there a few years earlier. And they just called up out of the blue and said, hey, my dad's getting a big four color press in and then we need to move that machine you're always interested in. You know, if yours, if you can move it by Friday, you know, how much does it weigh? Oh, 6,000 pounds, but it's really bottom heavy. That one was very, very easy to move. And so, but uh, it's, a, it, it's a medium format cylinder press. Uh, I think it's 14 and a half by 20 and a half. So it's like a Vandercook four size, but I, for the sheet size that you can print, it's actually pretty small. So we find it, it's, you know, we can do large runs with it. We'll use it with um, things that have large coverage. It is an amazing for an automatic press system where you can switch impressions or switch, skip an impression. So that it'll, instead of inking the form twice for every impression, it'll actually misfeed on purpose, go off an impression, then you're getting twice as much ink. So for large solids and things like that. That's awesome. But I know that in the machine, the man Roland headquarters in Germany, they have one of them in the lobby. And so when I was first working on it, I, can't, I think I'd seen it there and I wrote them a letter. And so someone from their museum sent us all these promo and manuals and things that we hadn't, we had a parts book, but not a manual. So that was useful. We have a ruling machine here and the same thing happened. Jim, you reached out to the company, right? And they sent you a big packet um, of stuff. Yeah, I was shocked they were still in business. Uh, but that was uh, Hickok, I believe. So thank goodness for those places that are still willing to send you that information. Yes. Right. right. Um, let's see. There was a really good question about the uh, keyboard uh, yep. on the linotype. Um, yep. They were wondering if the, the I can't say it, QWERTY, you know, the, the keyboard we're used to, this one, <laughs> I just can't pronounce today, uh, was designed after this. And if not, is there a reason the linotype machine has what it has, um, like what, do you know much about the difference between the keyboard layouts? So I don't know much about where the QWERTY keyboard came in. I, my instant assumption is yes, absolutely. It was later, cause I think it was not one of the original. I don't think it was a tiny bit later than the original typewriting machine keyboards. I know that the, the thinking on the linotype keyboard, I know like with the monotype, it's gonna be a different system. So all these different companies had their own um, 
you know, basically patent, patented designs, right? With the, with the linotype, which they, once their patents are now also on the intertype machines, you know, you have all of your most frequently used characters on your left. So generally speaking, what you're doing is your left hand is sort of going along the keyboard and your right hand is dropping in, doing the space band, hitting the capitals, hitting the figures. And so like, if you're reading their training manuals, that's how you do it, but everyone had their own style basically. But so the thinking really is, you know, this is where most of the things are happening. So we're going to put all those lowercase letters right there. And then of course, the, the great documentary on the linotype uh, uh, in the newspaper business is called Farewell at Tuan Shirdlu. And so it's uh, the film of the last night of hot metal type setting in the New York Times press room. And it is just such a beautiful movie. It's only like 45 minutes. I think it's now free on the internet. Um, and then there's also Linotype the film, which is a really uh, incredibly insightful and really funny documentary just to see how people are using Linotype. But, uh, but Etuan Shirdlu is the first two rows, first two vertical rows on a Linotype keyboard, E-T-A-O-I-N-S-H-R-D-L-U. And so amongst, you know, compositors for newspapers, sometimes people use it in different ways, but if there was a mistake in that slug, they would just reel their fingers at Tuan Shirdlu, and then the, the compositor would know to toss that, to melt that slug and reuse the next one, or maybe it's the end of the article they would do at Tuan Shirdlu, who knows? And so, so sometimes it would slip into print, but you know, as soon as you start to talk client types with people, you're like, oh, at Tuan Shirdlu, blah, 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 blah. So that is, one of the hallmarks of that keyboard. But in terms of how the various keyboards worked, like truly developed, I'm not quite sure where the QWERTY came in. But I'm sure well, there's some Museum of Printing in North yeah. Andover, Massachusetts would be happy to answer your question. Exactly. We can find that nerd. There is that nerd who knows yes. that information. <laughs> Um, well, those were the big questions that I had already seen in the chat. If I missed anybody or if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, because Dan, thank you. This has been great. Jim Moran. Uh, Dan, one of the things I was thinking about looking at your pieces is uh, you must have a, a fascination for newspapers, uh, particularly older ones and that phrasing and even styling that they're using because you do it well. Well, I, A, thank you. And then B, no, it, it is like anytime you're doing something long enough, then you look back and you're like, whoa, you're thinking like, I remember I had a, we had an old friend who actually was an urban designer who lived in Montreal where I'd gone to school for a few years with an old friend of my dad's and was also a painter. And at one point you've been painting cows. And I think you're like, oh, and we started talking about it or whatever. And then you look back, you're like, oh my God, he's been painting cows, like one aspect of his weird urban paintings for 25 years. And so sometimes you look back at what you've been doing. So after this, I look back, I'm like, oh my God, I was making prints with large blowups of newspaper articles. You have a huge letterpress print where I think it's like 40 by 80 inches. And it's on this Japanese, uh, actually this paper from Pangpi, I think it was a Chinese handmade paper. And the headline is, uh, what is it? Antichrist is alive and a male Jew Falwell contends. Right? <laughs> it was a pretty, you know, somewhere from the 90s, but I remember I clipped the newspaper clipping, decided it was important. And then 10 years later, it made this big print. So I do, I, I would not have known that had I not started to do this and realized how much uh, it was a part, and I also feel like I feel my daughter is 18 and, you know, is getting in, you know, we would be watching The Daily Show and that's how she's getting her news. And so I feel still somewhat lucky to have that attachment to print journalism, you know, that it's, you know, you're on the bus and people are sharing the newspaper and someone asks a question and the other person's like, hey, they wouldn't print it if it wasn't true. I remember hearing these things. I'm like, that's, well, that's not true, but that's so exciting. So, yeah. Thank you, journalists. That's the bottom line. Yep. And actually, let's see here. 
And I didn't even know necessarily. Then the other, some of the other things that would happen that was kind of fun is if you're writing about, you know, your own life. For me, my own life became making these prints every day. So you, know, you come into work and you have work to do. And I'm like, oh man, you know, I have no idea what I'm going to post. And then the person's like, well, you're up here till two in the morning last night. Why don't you write about that? And so then it's the whole thing about how you need to really keep your shop cleaner because, you know, the capital E's weren't distributing, which I just fixed recently, finally. And then you have these little piles of E's. And so then, you know, that becomes the article. But there is something about newspapers too, where it's like that, like you said, it's going to be something tomorrow that, it's this weird record of that particular moment in time. And even looking through some of these things, some of the jokes are so much less relevant X number of years later, because who remembered the prime minister of Finland was visiting when this happened? <laughs> so, yeah. Delightful. Well, if we don't see any more questions, I saw you. Oh, Mark, did you have a question? Maybe talking to somebody in the room? Okay, now, now, okay, get all these technical things. Um, can we talk about the uh, Ludlow? Mm -hmm. um, do you find the Ludlow easier to cast with than the, you know, the linotype? So, I guess, you know, everything depends like on its use. So for example, we'll do sometimes, and we don't do a whole lot of, commercial type. We do some commercial type casting for other printers and book binders and things like that. Um, not as much as could justify the amount of time I spend working on those machines. But sometimes that we'll be doing like graduation ceremonies and people need a name set you know, for the diploma or for the book or whatever it might be. So if you have 150 names, the linotype is going to be so much easier. It'll be so much faster. A well-running linotype is just so efficient, right? Um, if it's just something really small and straightforward, you know, the, with the level of your hand setting, so you can switch typefaces instantly, you can cast larger faces. So generally speaking, in terms of the kind of work as an artist and that we do in the shot, a Ludlow makes so much more sense, so much easier, so much simpler, right? It's just, uh, there's some benefits in terms of the height, the type height to the shoulder where the level is a lot deeper than at least a North American linotype where it's a lot more shallow. So that if you have open areas, you're less likely to get ink from the rollers. But, but it, it just totally and completely depends on the purpose. You know, so I, like a level is a much more versatile and useful machine, whereas a linotype really is set for doing larger volumes quickly, right? Okay. And then there's, you get into different, um, different typefaces too. So like, you know, all of the Ludlow type, you know, like where's the one that uh, Ludlow is making, it's all designed, you know, by Ludlow, by, I think it's our Hunter Middleton was the lead designer. And so there's certain things like Tempo, right? Which is sort of a somewhat generic face, right? There's certain typefaces where you see it and you're like, oh my God, there's so much activity, right? You, the way the letters are sort of bouncing around and Lud, uh, linotype might not have a typeface that's, that, that has that kind of equivalent, right? But then some of the book type and some of the other linotype typefaces like Metro are also really unique and have their own quality. So I feel like a Ludlow, it's just such a useful, I don't know if you've done typecasting with one or the other. Well, we, we, we just got one for the okay. museum we're starting up. And I'm trying to push that because it's something that you can learn fairly quickly. Yep. And, um, you know, you, you, your generation, or at least the younger generation, is doing too much on the computer. Hey, I'm, I'm trying to push hand setting. Yeah. Right? That's where I find it's enjoyable and it just makes sense for my generation. Yeah. No, and I also feel like, you know, we'll have like school groups sometimes come through and different things. And there is just any letter press printing, but, you know, the way people's eyes light up and just go wide open when they're seeing someone hand set a couple letters and then it's printed. And with the Ludlow, you know, literally, you know, you're setting something and then this hunk of metal pops out of the machine 25 seconds later, 
you know, that a word someone thought of and then it's in their hand, you know, in physical form is pretty weird. But I, I definitely feel like there are certain things we could not do if we didn't have the linotype, but that's because we've pushed ourselves into doing that kind of a thing. And so like, if it's a broadside project, if it's, you know, not a, like for we, commercially, and then even in terms of just sort of funner art projects, the Ludlow is just so much more versatile that I feel like it does make a lot of sense, but the linotype, uh, it's like a very bad addiction. So like we have now behind me is a, oops, I should turn it on. Uh, a uh, pencil printing, which you guys may have seen these in the internet somewhere, right? And so, you know, this is, these are two machines that we picked up solely because we're casting linotype slugs. So you can cast from the either Ludlow or linotype slug on like handset, it's not gonna run the type. And so then you could sell pencils. And so I feel like that, you know, if you're casting at a thinner, like a six point mold on a Ludlow, you could still do that. But so it's whatever makes sense. But I do, I do feel like a Ludlow is a great step into the typecasting world. And there's not really a reason you would need a linotype unless you're getting into, you know, very particular other things. So or someone just drops it off and says, here, it's yours. It's a, you never, you have to be so careful in answering those phone calls or emails. It is the, it was good for a while and then you just completely fall off the wagon and there's now two linotypes and then this thing. I did say no to a bigger pencil machine, so. But no, but I do feel like in terms of basic, uh, like if you're incorporating hot metal into a shop, I'd love to make sense of that compared to handset typesetting, I remember Don Black in Canada uh, picking up, I think it might have even been some handset type, you know, long, long time ago on a paper cutter. And, and this is like years ago and he was showing off the Ludlow. And I remember him saying something along the lines of, once you sell someone a Ludlow, you've got a customer for life because you're always gonna want more matrices. And it's so true because once you start printing from a Ludlow or line of type, if you're printing from a Ludlow, you have perfect brand new, never used before type, right? right? And the machines are finicky, but it's all, you know, as long as you're maintaining it, clean it frequently. I didn't believe Dave Seat when he first told me, but like cleaning it, we clean our machine, even if we're not using it that much, at least once every two weeks, or we try to, and it just runs so much better and you don't run into problems, but you know, it's brand new type that's never been used before. You know, the E isn't more worn than the Q. And I feel like that's, and you can, you know, there's things you can do handset type thing you just can't do with any of these machines, but but there's other layouts you can do that are so much easier. And so I've, I I think it's a great tool, but you just get into a particular system and then you keep using it. Well, thank you. Is it more offset printing that you do in addition to the letter press? No, letter I'm, press I'm, I'm retired. I, I retired out of the newspaper trade. I see. Okay. And, um, that, that was my when I, I started out in in my apprentice. I, yeah. was on a, I was on a letter press. Right, right. And, and then they kept kicking me out and saying, right. no, you got, we're, we're, we're dinosaurs here. Move yeah. out and, 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 you know, learn something. So we can keep in the union. There was a guy I worked with in an offset shop when I was in DC who had big, I think there were, I guess the Hawaiian shirts who would always wear. And he was a stripper and he was just like trying. And that was like his main role in a print shop. And he was just like trying to get to the point where he could retire still stripping film up before having to like, you know, just like if you could just hold on to this, even if it's a part-time job, like, you know, just because that whole, everything was just changing. Oh yes, I, it, it's, it was amazing experience to go through that period. Yeah, sure. They, you know, in one shop where we were throwing stuff off the loading dock, hoping yeah. the scrapper would pick it up because we didn't know anything about um, the artists that were picking this stuff up right. at nights. Now that I retired all of a sudden, Wow. So where uh, would you have kept it all these years? Right? <laughs> That's the question. My kids keep asking that. Yeah. Yeah. No judgment. I have, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have no room now for type. Yeah. And I being I don't have knees, I can't climb the ladder to pull a case off. You know? Yeah. So yeah, it's I'm still buying it though, because it's great. Yeah. And there are fonts out there that are just 
fabulous and they haven't been digitalized yet. Yeah. So you got to have the real stuff. Yeah. No, and every once in a while, there's a graphic designer who really wants that. And it's just so much harder to work with, depending on what they're asking for. So you're like, why did I brag about having all this special <laughs> mats and metro number, whatever? But yeah. Well, but it is it like in the newspaper business, too, because, you know, like Dick, who's this line of tape had come from, would work in a line of tape, but most of his career was running the Ludlow. And so you'd have big, huge Ludlow sticks and other things. And so you realize, I think, at that paper, you know, it was probably 60 people that were making, you know, in the composition room, the press room, et cetera. And so it, it you know, everyone is already so segment, segmented in these places that it really is, a, it, it took, like for me, it might take, five, you know, very quickly an hour, maybe it'd be three hours, depending if you started writing or something, but, you know, this is to do one column. Right. Whereas the newspaper, you know, is 60 pages of this, you know, and so you have, you know, 80 people every single day that are starting from scratch, with the exception of the classifieds. <laughs> so. Yep. I that was amazing. In fact, it, actually, somebody asked me if you have any interest in casting foundry type at all or like casting singly. So. I would say. You just, you're using what you have, right? Mm -hmm. So like people who, I definitely, like a monotype system would be something that I've never really explored with, but would be really fun to do. But it, again, it starts to get into such a different world that it's like, so even for here, like doing little corrections where you're slicing off you know, the space between one word and that's really not how linotype corrections would be made. Mm -hmm. Um, is already finicky enough, but, uh, but, and there's people who do that so well in terms of casting type, but, but it is, you know, the linotype type is a much softer metal, the, the lead composition. And so, you know, sometimes if you're printing directly from, if you're printing directly from the type with a lighter color, you, know, you have to be really gentle with the impression because your pale yellow or pale green is getting a little tone from, you know, even if you're not printing with that much impression, you know, yeah. and that's just because the battle I happen to have in the pot versus turning into a stereotype and then, you know, just using it as the malt. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. It does. I, uh, I do want to wrap up only it's a lot. We've had your time so much, um, but I, there's someone did have a question. I, I am curious as well, because I'm an instructor how does any of this flow into your teaching and how does that, um, that world work, your teaching, your instructing with, with um, what you do every day? Right, so uh, what, for sure, like the students will come through here once a semester, not in the last year. And I feel like I got into teaching, Teaching is a very strange thing. I, I really enjoy it. You know, one, two of my three employees are all former students. You meet really uh, insanely talented and super nice people. And it's really exciting to be in a place where you're helping someone learn about something and then you see their work two years later and you realize, you know, that these little light bulbs are going off just because of conversations you're having, which is just, you feel very, very it's like you're realizing that you have more experience than you think. But I got into, you know, my, like for me, my, the positive thing that I bring to printing, at least I teach, I was teach, I taught some at URI and now at RISD, and it's just one class intro and advanced letterpress and then that's it, is, you know, I'm coming from a commercial printing, commercial letterpress background. And, you know, here's how you can use these tools to make your artwork and I feel like that's the that's a different enough perspective compared to a lot of that because a lot of the just fine art you know I'm also an artist and a fine artist but but having that additional perspective I feel like is just a benefit for the students or at least I hope um, but it's always a strange balance too because yesterday was the first in-person class of the semester so it was virtual for a day and now it's in person it's not it's only seven students which isn't too bad but man, teaching is exhausting. 
Yes, it is. So, so it's great, but, um, but I feel like, and then there's, you know, there are students who've come in and used the linotype. There's students who, towards the end of the semester, especially if it's more advanced class, might want to use the linotype. And so, I mean, the Ludlow. And so the more that can be available to people, the better. Um, and so I feel like, the, I, and then even just talking to younger students, like in high schools and stuff, we try to do as much as it makes sense to, but, um, but we don't do so much classes here, although we've perpetually are planning to set something up for workshops because you would know it's very lucrative, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. You can teach and make money. It's a good, yeah, exactly. it's a good setup. So, <laughs> but so, yeah. So I, I bring this knowledge into the classroom and they come here. Um, but with letterpress printing, it really is like, here are these tools. You know, to me, it's important to recognize the commercial and the social, logical or, or historical component in education because letterpress isn't just like the beautiful bumpy handmade paper uh, with that wood type that they chopped. They killed trees to make the wood type. <laughs> trees would clean the atmosphere, <sighs> those butchers. <laughs> Um, so, but I feel like it's nice to, to know there's all these other things that people can use. Yeah. That Sweet. Right. Well, thank you, Dan. And thanks for talking about that no, a bit. It was good to hear. No problem. Thank you.